All right, welcome guys to uh, Things Network uh, webinar. Um, this one is on LoRaWAN security. My name is uh, Johan Stocking. I am tech lead uh, of the Things Network and um, I'm not a security expert. So all the information in this webinar is based on uh, practical knowledge and um, a lot of experience that we've had so far in one and a half years running the Things Network. So let's share my screen. Here we go. So um, this uh, webinar is about security in, uh, in LoRaWAN. Um, uh, so um, yeah, a bit of my background. I am a tech lead and co-founder of the Things Network. And I work, um, we work with a team of uh, 15 people here in Amsterdam on uh, building the Things Network, the core components, and together with a community of um, uh, more than 350 communities, I think, um, almost hitting 10,000 members worldwide. Um, so today the agenda is about, um, it's a bit technical. Um, first of all, I want to start with um, some information about the context of low power wide area networking because that is basically what gives, uh, what constrains um, what we are doing in security. Uh, then I want to tell something quickly about LoRa and LoRaWAN in general and then I want to dive deeper into uh, keys um, and then the threats and tips. Um, a bit about the Things Network, uh, how we work with security in our network server, and then um, there's a there's a short conclusion. So first, uh, two steps back. So LoRa one modulation, and the LoRa modulation is designed for um, low power wide area networking, and low power wide area networking uh, enables a lot of new IoT solutions that have not been possible before but also it makes a lot of existing iot solutions uh, a lot cheaper uh, and easier uh, because for example you don't have to pair with all kinds of wi-fi access points um, but you can just broadcast and uh, and have less pairing with um, with your device um, it's also um, ideal for for resource constrained devices so that run on a battery for example um, outdoor solutions, um, devices that are installed somewhere on roofs, um, low power wide area networking devices, they send data, uh, very little data, and just once in a while when something happens, so there's an event uh, or there is an interval when, when data is sent. Uh, and in case of LoRa and LoRa 1, you can also send data back to the end device. And, and this, this this context um, is also what makes it a trade-off between cost and security. So um, <clears throat> uh, you really have to, if you're in, in very high resource constrained devices, you have to ask yourself how secure can you make it. So that is that is one of the one of the things I like to mention. So this is basically the cha the, the challenge is how to verify the identity, the message integrity, um, and the payload security of devices. Um, that communicate over kilometers of range um, are cheap, uh, that work years on a battery. Um, they send only very tiny messages, so um, that are part of a public network um, and that support end-to-end -end encryption where only you have the keys. So, so this is basically the, the big challenge and, and LoRaWAN is only a part of, it, of this. Uh, and I'm also going to go over a few other things to, to make this, uh, to, to cover all these aspects. So, so LoRa is, um, is long range, uh, low bandwidth, um, and um, uh, a typical LoRa one, so a software setup, uh, looks like this. So you have devices, they are connected to, uh, or they have, a, they have coverage uh, provided by uh, one or several gateways. Uh, th these gateways are connected to a network server, and uh, your application is connected to 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 the network server. So this is this is a typical setup. And the uh, in LoRa one in in the security, um, you the devices have a session with uh, with the network server, and um, uh, the session contains the device address uh, and two session keys. One is the network session key, and the other one is the application session key. And the idea is that the network session key is used for uh, identification. Um, so is this message, is it really from this device? Um, and the application session key is used for payload encryption, decryption. 
um, which is only has to be known to the application uh, on paper. Uh, and then there are frame counters that count the number of uplink and downlink messages. Um, so the the sessions the session keys basically looks like this. Um, the, the network server needs to have a network session key, and the application server has the application session key. This is the theory. Uh, I'll come back to this later. When it comes to um, provisioning, there are two ways to to set up a session. The first one is over the activation, and this is where a device creates a new session. Uh, with the network server, uh, generates a new device address uh, and a new pair of session keys. And then there's activation by personalization. And this is where the device is proficient with a static device address and a static network session key and um, application session key. Um, the recommended way to, to use LoRaWAN is using over the activation. Um, but of course, this needs a uh, downlink possibility to the device. Um, and, um, uh, for example, activation by personalization is, is in that sense, uh, easier. Um, it's very highly resource constrained devices, devices that don't, don't listen, uh, back on, on data, which is not fully lower one compliant, but it happens. Uh, and one of the use cases is, um, uh, for example, development and testing. That's where we see ABP, but the recommended way is using over the activation because it sets up a new session with, uh, with the network server. Um, so yeah, we have the keys, uh, in, in over the activation, we have, uh, the app key that's, um, uh, a shared secret, um, symmetric uh, key. And, um, um, in, in, an, in a session, you have the session keys and when there's device activation, the session keys are, uh, derived from the app key, uh, which should be un unique per session. And then there are three questions. So the first one is, how do you get the, the keys in? How do you get the app key in, in over the activation? Or how do you get the session keys in, uh, in ABP? Uh, how do you keep these keys safe in the device? Uh, and finally, how do you change the keys um, later uh, when you transfer ownership or when you think that your device has been compromised? So first, um, how do you get the keys in? Um, so what, what, what often happens is that um, the device uses the same app key for uh, for all devices in the application. So it's one binary sketch that is uh, uh, that is uh, on, on the on every device. Um, and this is this is really easy to read because if you have if you have one device physical access, you can read its memory, uh, and if it's not encrypted, you can just read the app key. Uh, so a better practice is to to generate a different app key for each device. Um, uh, which needs, of course, uh, a manufacturing step um, or uh, provision it later. Um, and uh, also a good practice is to, to have a, a second band on the device, uh, for example, Bluetooth, uh, to, to provision uh, an app key um, that is completely uh, disconnected from, from the LoRaWAN communication. Um, how to keep the key safe? Um, so what would we, um, what we currently see is uh, the, the keys are constant in, um, in, uh, in the code, insecure flash memory or EEPROM. Um, so a better practice is to use a secure element for the key storage. Um, but what would be even ideal is that there is a secure element that actually does all the, uh, LoRa related operations, uh, on the device. Uh, and finally, how to change the keys. Um, so Laura one doesn't provide for, for a mechanism to, to change keys. And I think this is, this is good. It's out of scope of the Laura one specification. Um, what happens a lot today is, um, in, in ABP, there is no way to change it. That would require, uh, like an, an, uh, an update. Um, and if you use over the activation, uh, you can, you can get a new pair of session keys. Uh, but you would uh, need to initiate a new join, uh, a join and set up a new session with the network server. And what we see very often is that these sessions are kept alive uh, indefinitely. Um, and it, it's fine. Uh, it's, it's according to specifications, but it means that you're, you're, you never regenerate your session keys while it's technically possible. Um, so better practice is to use of the activation where you rejoin once you think that there might be something wrong. Um, uh, and again, um, uh, yeah, provision uh, a new app key uh, using a second band, also in devices that are already deployed. 
so back to, to the overview, um, the, um, the network session key is used for message integrity, application session key for, uh, for the join encryption and decryption of uh, application payload. But what happens uh, in practical and also on the things network is that almost all, if not all um, network servers are an application server according to LoRaWAN specification. So they are both um, the network server and the application server and they handle join for you, they handle LoRaWAN encryption and decryption. And um, the reason for this is that it's much easier for the, um, uh, for the application developer. They don't have to implement any specific LoRaWAN um, uh, encryption and decryption. Um, so within that context, um, we actually need another layer of security uh, to, to make this more secure. Um, so we have, for example, um, <clears throat> we can use uh, an asymmetric cryptography, uh, where we basically have an end-to-end -end, uh, encryption between the device and the application, where the, uh, where the key is only known in the device and in the application, and where this is not the same key, because in LoRa 1, the session keys are symmetric keys. Um, uh, this is uh, this is already uh, this is already being done in in the industry, um, but it's it's a bit of outside of the scope of the LoRaWAN one specification. But it's it's highly recommended to do something like this, and for this you need a secure element. Um, to make it easier, uh, and this is also what we are working on in the Things Network, uh, integrating with IoT platforms uh, to get this uh, out of the box, uh, where you as an application developer trust your uh, IoT platform uh, to to handle the encryption and decryption, uh, and where you still don't have to care about um, LoRa one specific things, uh, but uh, still uh, can rely on uh, the uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography. So then I want to go a bit through uh, the threats and some tips around them. So I listed a couple of them. Uh, this is not a complete list, uh, but these are the most common things. Um, and the format is uh, basically, I'm going to start with, um, um, yeah, kicking in an open door. It's a Dutch saying, but this is like the first one, of course, is uh, physical access to the device. So um, uh, this is, it's a, it's a device installed somewhere and um, uh, you, can, you can always, you can find it. Uh, you can destroy it, you can open it, you can influence its sensors. Uh, this is not something that you can, you can really stop except from um, uh, hiding the device or having a movement sensor in the device to to at least to uh, to sense that there is actually something happening um, uh, and and a reason to to do this for attackers is of course to influence your uh, your uh, data collection and um, uh, maybe uh, uh, make uh, influence the model and, and decisions that are being taken um, well, the second one is uh, is metadata collection, and this is uh, this is something that is that is really well possible with LoRaWAN. Uh, not necessarily a big problem, but it's something to be aware of. Um, so the way it works is that it's it's like uh, collecting the activity of a device, and that is the, the public um, metadata that is sent through the air. So everybody can set up a LoRaWAN gateway and can start collecting messages that are being sent. And one of the things that you'll see is the uh, device address, uh, the frame counter, so how many messages uh, this device has been sending in this session, um, and you see the, the size of the payload. And um, if you have a device that sends a message when something happens, so when someone rings the doorbell, for example, um, then if you collect that message, you don't have to see what the payload is. It, it's just it's the fact that the doorbell sends a message means that somebody is ringing the door. Uh, so this is a typical uh, metadata collection um, attack. And the way to mitigate this is, for example, to send a random uh, heartbeat uh, on a, a heartbeat on a random interval um, and um, uh, to, to mask the event driven activity. Uh, then we have a triangulation. Uh, this is um, uh, this is something that um, took a while in the LoRa Alliance to um, to uh, to get to the people um, currently big uh, commercial operators are offering this and um, the way it basically works is uh, on the time of arrival of a message uh, on a gateway and that means it allows you basically to to see where the signal came from 
Uh, and this combined with metadata collection allows you to see where, where the signal came from. It doesn't have to say a lot, uh, but especially in moving objects, uh, uh, you, can, you can kind of follow where things are. Um, one thing you can do about is to, to rejoin. Uh, you have a new device address. Um, it's, it's not something you have to care about a lot, but it's good to, it's good to, um, to be aware of it, that triangulation is something that, that works without access to, to what is actually in the payload. Uh, then we have uh, two kinds of malicious gateways. So the Things Network is an open network, um, uh, as, as many other networks. And um, <clears throat> we are working on a new uh, gateway uh, connector, uh, which is an authenticated secured connection with the Things Network. Uh, but we also uh, still allow a lot of um, gateways that don't have this secure connection, um, which is fine on the public community network, of course. Um, and the um, the idea is basically, for example, as it, as it is a UDP protocol, uh, it's easy to uh, to do uh, spoofing, um, and um, uh, this allows you, for example, to to collect uh, packets or filter out packets. Um, and um, uh, what to do about it? Well, that is the authentic authenticated gateways, so using a um, secure connection. Uh, and of course, this also uh, disappears when we have uh, the scale with the Things Network that are a lot of networks, a lot of gateways on the network. Um, then the problem disappears automatically. The second one is um, actually solved in LoRa 1.1. 1 .1. It's an issue with um, the frame counters. Uh, it means that um, the, uh, there is a bidirectional communication uh, in LoRa 1 possible. And you can, for example, you can ask for a confirmation of an uplink message. And um, the, the problem with LoRa 1 is that the confirmation from the network doesn't indicate which message it actually confirms. So a malicious gateway in between can, can filter uh, a uh, confirmation from a previous message and not send it to the device to use it later to confirm a message that shouldn't be confirmed, for example. Um, this is solved in LoRa 1.1.1, 1, 1, 1, uh, and this is also um, solved when you have an authenticated gateway. Uh, then we have uh, the replay attack that is collecting a message and um, uh, store the message to, to send it out later. And um, uh, the, yeah, the way it works is just set up a gateway, uh, collect a message, store it, and uh, let a note send it as if it was uh, the device. So, for example, the doorbell is, a, is an example where you collect uh, the message that a doorbell sends, uh, so you can play it back uh, and then trigger the same event um, as, as if somebody would be pressing the doorbell. Um, yeah, yeah, what to do about it? Um, so the, the network keeps track of the the frame counters. So I, I think that all the network servers keep track of this. Um, mm -hmm. So if you uh, if you have a like an, a, a decent LoRa one network server, uh, you won't you won't have this uh, this issue. Uh, one thing to note here is though that um, if you use AVP, so activation by personalization, uh, and you have a fixed uh, session uh, keys, <clears throat> uh, then what we see often is that after a power cycle. Uh, the device frame counter starts from zero again. Uh, and then uh, what, what people often do is to reset the frame counter. That's also possible on the Things Network in the console. And then the counter starts from zero. But then there's no way uh, to see uh, from a previous message of a higher uplink counter uh, if it was, uh, if it was an, an original message or if it was recorded in the past. So one of the, one of the ways to mitigate this is to use over the activation where you can be sure that your frame counter is unique within that session. Um, and then finally, um, we have the, uh, the untrusted uh, application server. So this is uh, basically what I, what I mentioned before. Um, so this is where the application server, which is part of your network server, um, uh, is something that you, you, you can't fully trust. And um, uh, so in this case, uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can set up a private network, or you have to uh, add an additional layer of security on top of Flora One. Um, in the Things Network, we have a uh, we split out the network server components from the application server components, and it's actually possible to run 
the LoRaWAN application server, so the, the role that the LoRaWAN application server has uh, in your own uh, domain while still using the public community network. Uh, but many, many network uh, servers do not support this. So uh, this is a bit of, of the architecture. Um, on the right, you see uh, the open source components. And um, uh, according to the LoRaWAN network server uh, terminology, uh, that is in the things network uh, is, is handled by the router broker and network server. And then the, the LoRaWAN application server, that is the, the handler. And um, as I'll show you later, uh, you can run the handler in your own domain. Um, and the handler does the uh, uh, encryption and decryption. And this is actually the, the component that has your uh, shared secret key. Uh, yeah, so the way it is basically works is that there's the three components. Um, we can scale them horizontally. Uh, we do this uh, in four data centers around the world. Um, so a message goes from the community network, gets picked up by a router somewhere and is delivered uh, encrypted to the uh, application. <clears throat> then, um, yeah, you can set up a private network or dedicated service, uh, same components. Uh, we are still working on making it uh, federated with the public community network. Uh, so you can actually exchange traffic with the public community network while having everything in your own domain. And this is, for example, where you have an application domain where, where your handler runs. Um, on your own server where encryption and decryption of messages happens. <clears throat> so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's already um, uh, most of it. So the conclusion at uh, the, the good practices is uh, to uh, provision yeah, truly randomly generated uh, keys to uh, different keys for each device um, and be able to provision uh, a new key through it over a second band. So for example, uh, Bluetooth. Um, also, uh, if you do not have uh, any additional layer of security on top of LoRaWAN, uh, make sure that you run the application server uh, rep responsibilities in your own security domain, uh, so using a private network or uh, running the Things Network handler. Um, when you're sending uh, messages that are driven by event, make sure you have like a, a, a random message in between. Um, do not uh, use, uh, yeah, use a fixed uh, payload length. The, the issue is that um, the payload length um, can uh, indicate what the content is. So, for example, if uh, if it's cold, it might be a longer message than, uh, than when it's hot. Um, and finally, um, yeah, use a secure element. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this would uh, either do the LoRaWAN uh, security um, uh, operations or adds a, a layer of encryption to your application uh, for, for example, asymmetric uh, keys. So that's the, uh, that's the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, also um, community can ask uh, questions on the forum or in the uh, YouTube channel, and uh, Lawrence will uh, will ask me. But, uh, any questions? Yeah. About the double secure with Bluetooth, then you also need Bluetooth receiver on your device, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is uh, indeed if you have a dual band, you you indeed you need. A Bluetooth uh, uh, receiver on your device. Um, these are not very expensive, though, and and this is also this is again the the trade-off between cost and security. Uh, so how much do you care about your your security? If it's an open temperature sensor somewhere, then you probably wouldn't care. Um, and the same goes for a secure element. That's also not a chip in your device. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're in on Laura one, the, the the shared secret app key uh, would be provisioned in the device in a in a trusted domain, 
And um, if you're using a secure element, then uh, the secure element generates a private key, uh, which stays there, uh, and you get the public key out. Yeah, so that is that's the asymmetric key, uh, which is, of course, more secure, because if you have a symmetric key, then, um, yeah. All right. So I have a question here. When running a cus custom handler uh, in a TTN, custom encryption, for example, the uh, isometric crypto, is that redundant? I, I would say that it's still complementary because um, you you still have the attacks on, uh, for example, um, the uh, you you still have attacks on um, physical attacks. Uh, you you still need to if you don't have a secure element, for example, uh, but you 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 know that the app key is on your own server, uh, but still is in insecure flash memory on the device, um, then still, if you have a physical attack, people can read your, your app key. So I think it's, I think it's complementary to, to both uh, run the things network handler in your own server and, and also have a secure element. But again, it's, it's really a trade-off that you have to make um, for, uh, for cost and security. Yeah, or no. I think important to have maybe two, it's not only about the network server that should be protected uh, against replay attacks because all the nodes and the recurrent um, firmware of the RN chips are microchip. So where about this issue? But you're still able to uh, to the nodes to do replay attacks. All right. So the indeed the addition um, uh, from the audience here is indeed uh, uh, to also take care of the replay attacks on the on the end device this is of course also running firmware um, I know that uh, microchip has an update ready uh, which will be uh, out soon I guess right so yeah it's, uh, it's good good addition thanks all right anything else? Yeah. The one thing I missed in the, in the threads that you described is the uh, the whole uh, concept of denial of service in a, in a LoRa network. Maybe you can say something more about it. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, the denial of service attack would be um, on a radio level. It's it's really hard to jam uh, LoRa signal. Um, LoRa is a. Um, I actually have a, a slide for that. LoRa is. Um, spread spectrum modulation and um, so it's not like uh, let's see uh, okay all right I don't have them here um, so it's not it's uh, it's not like communicating on a single frequency but it as it uses spread spectrum it uh, spreads around uh, um, a center frequency um, and it, it that is that is pretty hard to jam uh, because then you would need to to jam a certain bandwidth of uh, frequencies. Uh, it's still it's not impossible to do um, with with LoRa. It's especially hard. Um, still, of course, it's radio communications. Um, uh, so yeah, it's 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 it is possible to disturb, um, but it's it's not a it's not a, an issue that is typical to LoRa. I think I would say it's the other way around. All right, any questions from the community? No, very good. Thank you, thank you very much for watching um, and um, see you next time.